what I'm going to do here is introduce another project that we've been working on. This is the third year of it on the fungicide side of things. This is our, we've been calling it the night spraying project. So we started off with herbicides. We, we looked at pre-seed burn down and in-crop applications of herbicides. And the theory there was what happens when you're spraying it in the middle of the night, basically, because we have GPS guidance now. A lot of the products weren't really registered at weird times. So we wanted to know, is it going to impact or, or can we fine tune our management practices by figuring out when we can spray certain things? So on the herbicide side of things, to give a quick recap, we were quite surprised how we found that first thing in the morning tended to be the poorest results in, uh, on the whole. Like, I mean, it's going to depend on the weather conditions as such, but pre-seed burndowns, we tend to be early in the morning. Uh, Roundup was actually one chemical that really surprised me on how poor the control was in the morning versus the daytime as much as 20, sometimes 30% reduction in efficacy. And as far as the in-crops are concerned, we found that the wheat herbicides were the best all-round herbicides, so they performed well under many different conditions. But the canola, both Roundup and Liberty, there was a clear disadvantage as far as chance of optimum control by spraying first thing in the morning. Daytime was always the best and nighttime was sort of somewhere in between. The peas actually a lot of times perform better in the evenings, uh, but now when we talk to fungicides, we're spraying it at a different time of year. We tend to spray our fungicides in July when it's hot, and our findings so far have actually been showing early morning fungicide application looks like the best chance of success. There's probably, and we, have a, we actually have some visual demos we'll show you in the canola a little bit later, but our logic in trying to explain some of this is that fungicides don't actually work the same way that herbicides do. They say that they're partially systemic, but they don't really move through the plant the same way that herbicides do. So maybe by spraying early in the morning or even at night when you have that heavy dew, that dew could be helping distribute the fungicide deeper into the canopy, helping control the areas that tend to be the spots where infections are coming on. So we've done this, this is our third year now, we don't really have the final years of data. We've done this on peas, barley, wheat, and canola. Mike Harding also has conducted this trial for us. We have sites with Kelly Turkington and Lacombe on the cereals and up in the Peace River area as well. Pretty, tip, pretty complex uh, interactions between environment and data points, so we're, it, it is hard to figure out exactly. I don't think there's any rules of thumb, but if we can sort of come up with some general guidelines that will increase probabilities of success, I think it's a great thing. So as far as um, the pulses, I'm just gonna pass it off to Dr. Shama Chatterton to talk about pulse diseases, so you guys can ask her as many questions as you like. I'll talk about the two major diseases that we see in peas. Um, the first one is Mycus ferella blight, and there's some nice examples of that uh, in these plots. Um, this is a foliar disease that has two names, uh, Mycus ferella blight or Ascochyta blight. You might often hear either, either one. They're both the same disease. Um, in Canada, it's caused by a complex of disease. Some are in the Ascochyta group, some are in the Mycus ferella group, which is why you have two different names. In Canada, the organism is primarily Mycus ferella, so that's why we call it with the longer name, Mycus ferella blight. Um, but you can see some really nice examples of it on here. Uh, it always starts at the lower canopy and then moves upwards. And the reason why it starts at the lower canopy is because this disease is primarily stubble borne. So anything uh, down below, the last time you grow peas, if there's still a little bit of pea stubble down there, uh, it'll start releasing primary inoculum in the springtime, canidia, and it gets trapped under the, the canopy where it stays really moist, humid, even under these dry conditions, down under the canopy you can have a lot of humidity in there. So you always see it start at the bottom and move upwards. If you only see it at the bottom third of your canopy, you usually don't need to worry about it. It has to move up to where the pods are to actually cause some yield loss. Um, and there's some nice examples here where it has moved all the way up to the top of the canopy and you can see that it'll start to infect the pods and you'll get some really nice this one's got really nice symptoms on the pods here. 
Um, and you can see when you start seeing symptoms like this on the pod that obviously the seeds can then be infected, but the source of inoculum that comes from the seed is actually very minimal. Uh, so there's no standards for planting or planting seeds that are infected with Microsorella or Ascochyta because almost all of the inoculum comes from stubble. So it's primarily stubble borne. Um, and then the other way that it's um, spread is actually by airborne ascospores. So you have conidia, part of the life cycle that's just in the lower part of the canopy. Those will then go through sexual reproduction, produce ascospores that can get blown uh, quite far. So similar to um, the, the fusarium head blight, the way that it's spread with ascospores that can move from field to field. So even if you haven't had peas in your crop, in your rotation for three to four years, you can still have Microsorella blight. I grow garden peas at home. Every year, there's a little bit of Microsorella blight. So it's basically just around in the environment and it's looking at the spread from the lower canopy up to the, to the upper canopy that you're trying to pay attention to. Now, having said that, um, there was research done in Alberta and Saskatchewan. I think they looked at 23 site years of fungicide spraying for Microsorella blight and found that there was very little economic benefit to spraying for it. And I think it's partly because when you look at the pea canopies as they are here, they're so dense, they're so intertwined that you don't get a lot of the fungicide um, actually moving down to the lower canopy where disease starts. So I think uh, the three conditions that need to be met to spray for Microsorella blight is you have to see movement from the lower canopy up towards the mid upper canopy. There should be good disease pressure, so rain or humidity, high humidity in the forecast, and you peas have to be at a good economic price in order to justify the spray. So those are sort of the three conditions that we look at to be met to, to put on a fungicide spray for Microsorella blight. Um, these plants also have Ascochyta foot rot. So when I said we call it Microsorella blight and there's two different organisms that are involved, the other organism is Ascochyta and that usually causes a foot rot. So you'll see this sort of black, and purple to black lesion at the base of the stem. Um, the problem with Ascochyta foot rot is that it really weakens the crown, so it makes the plants more uh, prone to lodging. Uh, so that's what you often see. But again, it's managed the same way as Microsorella, and there's not a lot of fungicide applications um, that are effective against that. Um, and Ascochyta foot rot is not to be confused with Fusarium or Aphanomyces root rot, which is my what's the research that's most dear to my heart, I guess. And I can never find it in, in Ken's plots. He seems to have a pretty clean field. I did find one, maybe one little plant that's uh, possibly showing some, some root rot, but this could also just be because of Ascochyta foot rot. So I brought my own because <laughs> we, have, we have lots. So I'll just pull out the samples that I brought and talk briefly about that. And then I can pass these around for people to have a look. Although they've kind of been heating up the sun. I'm going to spread this all over your plots. <laughs> <laughs> then I can come and find these here. So Ken's yeah. good rotation here, Sean, is that he had it in alfalfa for 15 years before you. Oh, okay. So I think this one was pasture. Pasture, like pasture it so it came out of pasture. Alfalfa and alfalfa and pasture. so you probably haven't been growing peas here for that long. So what we've been finding with the pea root rot issue um, is the surveys that we've done over the past two years, we found that it's pretty prevalent throughout all of Alberta. There seems to be pockets where we find more of it than others. Um, but really, um, there's two things that have kind of come together in the past couple years that have made the pea root rot issue explode. Uh, the first is the number of years that peas have now been cropped in Alberta. Probably 25 years, 25 to 30 years is when uh, producers first started growing it, particularly up in more of the central Alberta region where they were the first to adopt it. And then you have good crop rotations, you know, maybe every four years you're planting peas. So we're at the point now where we probably had five or six peas in a cropping cycle. So it's that long-term growing of peas coupled with the really wet springs that we've had the past number of years. Of course, not this year. But um, so that was the hypothesis that we're working with is that it's a lot of wet springs that are allowing these pathogens to flourish. Um, we, as a pathologist that's studying root rots, we were giving talks last year and we always said, let's just keep our fingers crossed for a dry spring and see what happens. So I'm sorry, 
But uh, so it's interesting from a pathologist's perspective now to see, okay, how is the disease changing under dry conditions? Um, and so what we see with this, the root rots, um, is that there's basically nothing left to the roots. And I can pass these around so everyone to have a closer look. These have been sitting, uh, I think we collected these last week, so they've been sitting in our, our cooler for a little while. And you can start to see um, like fun fungi actually growing on the roots. But basically what you get is uh, just a complete decay of the roots. You can see there's just a little stub of the tap root left. The lateral roots have been de completely decayed away. And then you see evidence of the, the uh, necrosis and the, the degradation of the root cortex. So what we're dealing with in this situation are two pathogens, uh, Phanomyces root rot, um, as well as Fusarium root rot. So the two of them seem to act in concert a lot and often make the disease impact uh, worse than one alone. Um, so I can pass these around if people want to have a closer look. I just try not to spread them in, in Ken's fields. Um, and then in terms of management for these root rots, um, all we can say right now is try to avoid fields that you know had a history of root rot in your, your crop. So if you grew peas four or five years ago and knew that you had some root rot, it's best not to grow peas in that field again because every time you grow peas, they, it'll probably get a little bit worse. Uh, we're doing some research looking at uh, seed treatment uh, applications, a couple different soil amendments that might uh, alleviate the problem. And then I know that the University of Saskatchewan, their crop development center, is do a lot of, doing a lot of work on breeding for tolerance to, to this pathogen. But, um, yeah, so I can pass these around, and then if you, uh, I just tried to give a really quick summary of the issue. So if you have any more questions, then just let me know. I have a question. Yeah. Fungicide timing, lot, lots of recommendations to hit it when these first start flowering. Yeah. But on a, a really wet year on irrigation. They could be flowering for an entire month, possibly. Um, so, is it worth doing another fungicide two weeks later on irrigation? Um, I, I would say that two fungicide applications probably wouldn't pay economically in the end. You probably wouldn't get that economic boost from a second application. Um, most of our fungicides, as we always talk about, work more as preventative, not as curative. So I think if you do get it on a bit earlier, you probably protect a better part of your crop than, than going for a second application. But I honestly don't know if um, there's been any research done on two applications. But I would say it probably wouldn't pay. It wouldn't pay for the spray, basically. So did you say most of the time it doesn't even pay to spray once? That's that's what the research shows. Um, that it's been really hard on Mycosphorella, with Mycosphorella blight to show that there is an economic benefit to spraying. So if you do spray, what would you, if it's not, if it's not Mycosphorella, what else is there to spray for? Um, there, uh, white mold is the other, the other disease, but... Is that more economical? What's that? that? Is that, is there any disease, is, is that one of them that would be economical? Or uh, for, for the root rots, are you talking about white mold or? No, I'm talking about more leafage, like spraying fungicide now. Um, Even Astakita or things like that. Astakita right? and Mycosporella are yeah, not economical, they're all is there any that are? I, I don't know if there is. I mean, I'm not going to say don't. It's fairly prevalent to spray your peas. It right? is, yeah. And it's <laughs> becoming more and more common to spray peas. I just think in research <laughs> trials that have been done, it's yeah. been really hard to show that there's an economic benefit. So, but those are those are the research plots, and I think it's often looking at there's yeah, not a lot of significant difference. Mildew. Yeah. So that I think just showing like that significant difference between treatments that have been sprayed with a fungicide versus they haven't, we often don't see that significant <coughs> difference in yield and Jen, have you in done field any, research. Any uh, testing with and without fungicides or? Uh, well, did night spraying projects, yeah. And I think if any crop did respond, it was the peas. <laughs> they do respond well, <laughs> Which is so the scary part of the story. Yeah. Um, and barley, but wheat seems to be pretty good these days. I have a hard time getting response to fungicides, but, you know, it's also a risk management tool. It's, it's one of these things that unless you have the heavy infestations, you may not see the yield reductions that that are there so yeah. yeah i've always struggled with fungicides myself but it is it you throw that 
I always say that farmers are actually in the business of risk management. So that's where, where fungicides fit in quite well. But as far as responses, the frequencies are much lower than, um, say, herbicides, for example. We're used to spraying herbicides. We know we get response and value out of that. Um, I was just touring a manager of a research company, or no, sorry, a company, he was leading the research. He says on the fungicide trials that they put out, they count on 90% of the time having usable data. Fungicides, 50% of the time. So it's just, it's just one of those things, I think. You know? Yeah, I think like the field trials with diseases are very difficult statistically to analyze to be able to come up with yeah. saying, okay, we see a significant difference in yield. Because when we're dealing with sort of small plot trials, disease spread is very patchy within our trials. So we often end up with huge uh, coefficients of variance. So there's huge amounts of variance within each plot, how much disease you see. So I think it's a bit harder with our research trials to always prove that difference in significant <laughs> yield. You can definitely see trends, what we would call them, right, where you can see that there's a boost. Um, and I think with peas, and he's saying the response to fungicide, sometimes you see a response even in the absence of disease. So there's always been a question of, is there something else that's, that's happening with the fungicides? Are they reducing some sort of subclinical infection, you know, disease that sustainability is the other issue, yeah. maintaining greenness. So. Maybe not disease, it's something else. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah, and I think, you know, in terms of spraying for Microsporella, like I said, you have to sort of meet those three criteria, and then I think you would say, yes, there is an economic benefit to spraying. But uh, in, a, in a dry year like this year, and we've gone out and done our surveys, we've seen very little Microsporella. There's there's a lot in Ken's plots, but that's because it's, ir the the yeah, it's, it's irrigated to, to push disease. So, On that yeah. note, we were on a tour with a group of farmers in Montana, and this guy had irrigated peas and amazing crops, and they were actually applying their fungicides through the pivot. Do you know anything about that? I know it's probably not a registered thing, but we were talking about being able to have a water volume high enough to get it in yes. into the canopy. Yeah, I don't know a lot about that, but for sure the idea of, of chem fertigation, you would get better penetrance into that lower canopy where the disease is spreading. And that's what you want to get is the, the prevention of it, of it spreading up to, to the upper canopy. So there might be some benefits to that. Hmm. Makes you wonder if it's worth doing some experimentation even in 30 gallons and whatnot to see yeah. if it's... I mean, it's a lot of water. It's going to be a pain, but if it works, then... Yeah, and because irrigation, like peas that are grown either for seed under irrigation or processing peas, definitely see more of an issue with Mycosphorella than a lot of the dry land peas, right? So... It's right before that quarter-inch rain, right? Yeah. <laughs> if anyone wants to see root rot, I'll pass these around. You can you can take them out and have a look. I'm not I'm not positive I even have And if you have any other questions for Shama, I guess probably even other pulse crops too, right? Yep. Yeah. Now's the time. Yeah, so we're doing some research on fab chocolate spot of faba beans. Not a good year for chocolate spot on faba beans. We've had a hard time finding any and trying to get it going in our own field trials. And then we also have some research on uh, gray mold and white mold and lentils. Again, not a great year to do trials on those diseases either. But. How long of a rotation, like, do you do see a bit of this in your field? How long of a rotation should you wait? For, for root rot, um, yeah. it depends on what the causal organism is. So if you decide to send your samples to some of the seed testing labs, I think BioVision 2020, the seed testing labs in Saskatchewan can all test for Aphanomyces. If your peas do come back positive with Aphanomyces, then we are suggesting at least six years between peas, but it might, might need longer than that. Uh, the research, all the research on the length of how long that it can survive in the soil has been done in tilled systems under warmer climates. So we don't really know on the prairies how long it will survive in our soils. 
So we're, so we're suggesting at least six years. Uh, fava beans are a good alternative because they are resistant to aphanomyces. Uh, fusarium root rot, I think we're you know, still about four to five years between rotation, but they don't have survival structures that can live as long. I'm not going to touch your piece, but I'll touch Kim. <laughs> like go. this, Ryan. <laughs> there you go. I probably got more of that coming home then. <laughs> cool. So that one there, <laughs> which one is that one again? That's so this is a Mycosphorella blight with a little bit of the Ascochyta foot rot. At the, at the base. And they're and basically the same disease? They, they're lumped together because it's caused by three different organisms. <laughs> that are, one, some are called Ascochyta, some are called Mycosphorella. So we just lump them together and call them all the same thing. Because if you did play them you couldn't see which one it was. Yeah. Both yeah, exactly. For farmers, they, they, mean, they, they just know it's one or the other. Yeah. Right, and so we have to have both on there. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I think everywhere else in the world they call it Ascochyta blight. In Canada we call it Mycosphorella. Although it is a fungus so that, that has just right. undergone a name change, and so now I think it's called Didymella. I can't keep oh, up, so <laughs> so maybe we have to change the name of that disease too. Wow. Yeah. When you say there's like it's not economical, was there a yield benefit? It just wasn't. By the time you factor in the cost of the chemical, I think that, I think that's, that's so there was a benefit. There's a ben there's definitely a benefit. It's but that's why the peas. Yes. Yeah, so peas should be at a high price, you know, which they are yeah. right now. Right. So you have to factor that into whether you get that, that economic yeah. return. So, yeah. Yeah. so during the day is the bet. Like the just seeing the, the impact on the disease has been a little bit tough. Is it because it's, it, was it dry? Is it, I'm just, okay. But the years you did the study, how far back does that go? They, like I didn't do the study. This is from other people at Ag Canada. And they did it, they did it in 23 site years. Um, so a number of different lo number of different locations in both Alberta and Saskatchewan. No, it was done prior to that. So yeah, yeah. So I mean, there might be yeah. Have you ever seen the conditions of those? Even though 25 sounds like a lot of site years, but the we have seen the conditions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the different locations. Um, I haven't done any studies on irrigation. Like really say they're hot day out or because we're trying to really when we irrigate our peas, we try to that's do like more um, a heavier watering but less, less frequent. Right, yeah. And to try and help okay. with that crop canopy. Yes. Environment yeah, exactly. Drier. Yeah. No, and I think that's that's definitely a good thing. Do you like heavy water, like more water and then not as often? Or the peas are not really three quarters of an inch at a time. So I don't know if that's heavy. I don't know. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. But we put on a lot more water than I was planning on this year. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I've never grown them on a irrigated peas. Irrigated peas look awesome this year. Yeah. They look awesome. Yeah. And even the Mycosphorella blight that I've seen under irrigated peas actually isn't that bad yeah. this year because there's still, I think, still the dry periods in between. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, uh, Shama, can you yeah. visually see the difference between Fusarium root rot and the Phanomyces? I can because I've looked at 15,000 roots. So average Joe would have a hard time? <laughs> yeah, it's okay. really hard. And what happens actually, even with these roots, now that they've turned black, it's almost impossible to tell what the yeah. difference is. Because so, fusarium generally causes just a blackening of the tap root. Aphanomyces causes an all over browning of mm -hmm. the whole root system. But if Phanomyces maybe will infect first, Fusarium comes on top and then just makes everything turn That's black. Uh, so, so I think for a long time we were assuming we were working with Fusarium root rot and didn't think that Phanomyces was a problem here. And okay. then uh, once you start digging a little deeper, you can find we it. Can find I it. seem to remember you saying, that maybe not, that one is more prevalent under dry conditions versus wet conditions. Yes. Um, so what we found in our surveys is that. Um, about 60 to 70 percent of fields north of Highway 1 were positive for aphanomyces, mm -hmm. and only about 18 percent were positive for aphanomyces in our brown soil zone. But the disease incidence and severity that we saw between those two areas were the same, so it would mean that there's likely more fusarium root rot down in our southern area. They prefer drier conditions, mm -hmm. and then up where um, 
more. Getting yeah. into the block. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 they like, no They've also had a longer history of pea production up there. I think it's only in the what, last 10 years or so that we see all the production south of Highway 1. Mm -hmm. So I think, too, it's been slower to catch up. We have better rotations up. down here. Than yes. Than yeah, yeah, and I think well, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> sometimes yeah, the true. options that they have to grow, like sometimes rotations are just canola, wheat, pea, right? And yeah. it's just kind of a three year rotation. So you can tell. Yeah. Yeah. Just see it. yeah. What about anthracnose? Is that a big deal or is it more lentil disease? Uh, that's more of a lentil disease, which we haven't seen a lot of <coughs> down in, like in, in southern Alberta. I think it's more prevalent in Saskatchewan again, but lentils haven't been grown here for as long. Mm -hmm. So. Changing. Yeah. Um, and then I should I should have mentioned too that we do see the root rot in lentils. Yeah. Uh, we've seen Both? some. Yep. Same ones. Same same, strain. same strains. Same pathogens. So we've seen some of that down here. And, yeah. yeah. So that one year where everyone grew lentils in Alberta, that was the year we got smacked with white mold. Yeah. That probably would have paid the spread. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's funny how that happens when all of a sudden one bad year experience and nobody's growing lentils. I have such a hard time getting the, the fungicide into the lentil. Into the lentil, yeah. yeah. Like 20 gallons isn't enough, but I mean, to use any more water, it's just you almost have to have two guys driving a truck with water. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mounted right on the water truck. <laughs> yeah. yeah. See, and yeah, we've, literally. we've been doing trials with, I think, um, because of that issue with white mold and lentils and people are afraid to grow them, we've been doing disease nurseries with white mold and botrytis for the past four years and it's, we have a hard time getting disease to develop. Like we have to irrigate it a lot. So we have a dry land site and the irrigated site. So maybe it was just bad timing. Yeah, I think it was. before my time, but yeah. bad timing yeah. when everyone wanted to grow lentils. It was actually the white mold that got me interested in the night spraying too because yeah. we were working on a, on a project in dry beans and the farmer had sprayed and then like the ran out and decided to finish it in the morning and there was oh, yeah. a perfect straight line really, yeah. in difference in control so like yeah, yeah. Oh, right. and then like we're we're at this. Yeah. Ken, when you said you do see some response from spring peas <laughs> some of the time or most of the time is it economical? Well, just in particular i think the night spring project's the only one i've ever done fungicides on peas and was it economical difference between uh, spring we haven't run the numbers but Usually, like Brian says, if it's if you see a statistical improvement in yield, yeah. then it's usually means usually. that it's yeah. 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 Well, it's almost lunchtime. Maybe if you could join me in thanking Shama for, thank you. for wisdom yes, thank you. Thank you. and for bringing.